whenever I can pick it up, I, I pick up the guitar. Gotcha. Because when I found the guitar, it was like I found everything I'd ever been looking for. When I hear someone that has control over their bending and their intonation, that to me is the most deadly thing on a guitar player. Mm -hmm. But we're all on the same road. Yeah. It's just where we're at yeah. on the road. Really take, take the time to find your tone, your touch, and your feel and work around that because I feel like that kind of set me free. the fire extinguisher my man oh, good morning <laughs> good morning indeed that's a good way hey better than my protein shake seriously, yeah man seriously, come dude. on that was awesome. my gosh everyone out there Dinesh from Gibson Brands here and I'm here with none other than the man himself Mr. Jared James Nichols hey everyone thanks for tuning in um so happy to be here man thanks for having me we are stoked to have you Absolutely. we are stoked to have you I'm glad you brought some goodies yeah, man, I, I unloaded my uh, my little jam room. I thought to myself, what can I bring? And I said, well, I might as well bring it all. Yes. All the stuff that like, I feel like when I look at it, I'm like, that's a huge piece yeah. of the puzzle. No, this is great. This is yeah. like show. This is like the best show and tell day ever. Dude, yeah. I have a, a, a couple of questions for you. Guitar influences. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing you. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out like there's moments where I see some of the clips on Instagram and all that where I hear like little pockets of stuff. But dude. Who would you say like like straight off the bat like the players that come to mind for you? So like when I first started like I won't get too deep into it, but I wanted to be a drummer. No way! Yeah, I thought that guitar. You know, everyone plays the guitar. Okay. And okay. Uh, I ended up getting a drum set from a brother's my brother's friend. Yeah. And my dad comes home and he's a construction worker and he literally walks in our basement. He's like, nope, no drums. Too he's loud. Like, way too loud. He goes. <laughs> You, I'll get you a guitar, it has a volume knob on it. Yeah. Smartest thing he ever did for me, you know? I was like, oh man. So I get a guitar, and the first thing I want to play is Black Sabbath. Nice. Led Zeppelin. Yes. Pink Floyd. Boom. I call it like the Mount Rushmore of classic We're rock. We're good. We're good. So the first guitar lick I ever learned, I taught myself. I had Paranoid on CD, and I taught myself. And it sounded like that. And then I remember there was a button on the amp, and it said like, distortion and I was like what does that do and then it's all like <laughs> then I played it with the CD game over game over I was like I'm a guitar player yeah and then it was dazed and confused and then Beautiful. It, you know all of those riffs that I feel like are eternal riffs yeah you know those are the ones that I learned yes and then I, you know I grew up I picked up a guitar it would have been the year 2005 ish okay so I was, I hit the ground running and influence wise, it was all classic rock. And then someone said to me, hey, have you ever heard Stevie Ray Vaughan? Okay. And I grew up in the same town, like right down the street where Stevie played his last show. Oh, no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like- The Alpine when, Valley. Alpine Valley. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up on Highway D right there. And I remember people saying to me, man, you know, check out Stevie Ray. Someone showed me a video live at the Elma Combo of Stevie. That's the one. And when I saw that, everything changed. Yeah. It was like, who is this guy? What is he playing? How yes. was he playing like yes. that? I remember he was playing licks. Didn't ask him, I'm gonna make a fool of myself, but he would be You're doing. Cool. And I was like, uh-huh. Dude, and like super clean. Yes. Like, the, yeah, yes. It was insane. So I got into Stevie Hard. Cool. And then it was like the blues. I found the blues and it was Buddy Guy. And buddy I, guy. I, I would play. And I would play things like um, from Stevie or whatever. I'd say, well, it sounds like he got that from Buddy Guy maybe. Or, you know, so I, I fell into the blues. And then I started to get into, I almost went backwards and I got more into like the guitar here. It was like, it was like Clapton, Peter Green. Yes. Gary Moore, uh, Gary Leslie Moore. West, sure. like Paul Cosso. Leslie West, not, oh, dude, yeah. Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then it was like, and especially at this point, that's when I was really into Les Paul's. Like I was finding that. 
And I was like, all my favorite players, I feel like, play Les Pauls. Right. So then I, I started to go down the rabbit hole of all of these different players and, and try and figure out what their identity is mm -hmm. and like what is it about their style that really excited me. Yes. And then I would try and take little pieces of that. And then ultimately, you know, when you're playing guitar 12 hours a day, you start to uh, start to try and sound like yourself. Yeah. You know, it's funny, you, you, man, me and you have a similar like road where as far as like the influences, it, it's like when I saw the Elma combo, mm -hmm. that was the same type of reaction. I was like, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Yes. Like, that's what we're going to try and emulate. And it was first it was get it as close as possible. Yep. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. What are the amps? What, what's the gear? What's a tube screamer? Dude, when I plugged in a tube screamer, it didn't do what I thought it was going to do. Like I thought it was immediately going to be a Macomba, <laughs> you know? Of course. And like I plug it into this clean amp that's not over, you know, it's not on the edge of breakup. I didn't mm -hmm. know, you yeah, know? Yeah, of and course. I'm like, it's not, why is it so hard, you know? I feel um, the same way with, with like guitars. Like we talked about this, we can go off on a tangent, yeah. but it's like when you see a, a guitar or a piece of gear, you automatically hear something in your head and you're like, I'm going to sound like that. Yes. And then you pick it up and you go, Mm, I don't really sound like that. And it's almost kind of weird to be like the person that's like, I actually use this and yes. no one else maybe might not use this as much. And it's like, you, you feel like this weird, like it's not, a, it's a pressure. It could be a pressure or, you know, again, you get to a point where it, it goes behind, uh, beyond that. Right. But like, you know, you said something earlier where it's like, you see Stevie Ray and then you start wondering, well, where did he get all that from? And like you said, Buddy Guy, like I didn't know anything about Buddy Guy until I, I found out that Mary Had a Little Lamb was a Buddy Guy song. Yeah, yeah. So then I was like, well, let's go check out his version. I was like, totally, there's some similarity there, but then it's totally different. So like, for instance, like, um, let me see. When I played, like Stevie would do a lick and he'd go like, um, right? And I was like, what is that? And I was like, where is he getting that? Or I'd hear him go like, um, you know, uh, he would, for Stevie, he would, you know, he would do the, and I was like, wait, there's a guy named Albert King when he did. Wait, but that's how Albert did it. Stevie did it there. And all of those players, it was like, it's, I think that's basically it goes down to the feel of it all. Yeah. It's like drawing from the same well. It's almost like cooking, right? You have all of these ingredients, but it's how you're putting it together. Yes. Yes. That's the sauce. So obviously you were listening to the greats. That's a perfect place to start i yeah. think you know you get the you get the blues influence you get the bending because mm -hmm. you're like trying to bend with those players and like it's got to be in pitch and like you when you play with the cd or like in my case yeah i think we had cds yeah we still had cds <laughs> but i was watching elma combo on vhs yeah. like that, that got you know but like you're you're trying to like and then when you get you know when, when you're playing with the tracks like you get to a place where you're like cool that bend sounded the same yeah. Like there's no rub. It's not, it, not I have it now. Uh, maybe I have this part. I don't have this part yet. Mm -hmm. I still go back and listen to Elma Calm and I'm like, man, I don't have that at all. Like there's certain parts where I'm like, yeah, cool. That's what I remember. Uh, but there's other parts where you're like, oh, wait a minute. A lot of guitar too, I feel like, especially, you know, when you're talking about that ilk, like Stevie Ray. And yeah. The, the more of the blues, rock, even the country it, there is a physicality to it. Yes. Where, you know, when everyone says, you know, like with Stevie, they're like, oh, I'm going to get, you know, Stevie played 13s or 14s. And it's like, okay, cool. But what, like you were saying with gear, what works for Stevie or what works for you? Yeah. It's not going to translate for everyone. Right. Um, but there is a physicality. It's like, you know, you have to like earn that kind of guitar playing, especially like learning how to bend, yeah. vibrato, your touch, your tone, um, regardless of style. When you hear someone that is dialed into their instrument, dialed into their guitar yeah. to a point that it's an extension of their voice, it's an extension of their expression, I think that is the ultimate. And regardless, it doesn't have to be blues, like any style. Sure. When someone is dialed in, ultimate respect. Yeah. And it shows that the hours were put in. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just said 12 hours. I mean, dude, I remember when the bug hits and not everyone could do this. I get it. You know, there's different, uh, you know, everyone's in different places in life. As long as you're playing on a somewhat of a regular basis, whether it be just like yeah. a couple of minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, a couple of times a week, just it's got to be part of the routine. You know, the hours put in, I don't know, you're probably not playing 12 hours a day or you're playing still I, a good amount of time every day. Would you I, say? I, whenever I can pick it up, I, I pick up the guitar. Gotcha. Because like guitar too, for me, when I started to play and when I started to practice, it didn't feel like I was working. Yes. Or it didn't feel like 
I was putting in time, oh man, I gotta practice again. Right. It's like, I can't, still to this day, like I'll get off, off the tour and I will be dog tired, but I will go and sit on the couch and I go to grab my guitar. It's like my comfort blanket. Yeah. It's just something, something that is, it never felt like a chore to me. It never felt like, oh man, I really gotta go practice. Otherwise you wouldn't be playing for so many hours. Yeah. hundred percent. I used to take a guitar. I was so into it when I, I, I had a guitar in my locker. Like I bought a little mini, like three quarters. Oh, nice. Yeah. I would take it with me to every single class. It got to the point, I think, where my teachers were so sick of it that they were just like, yeah, like I would just sit in the back and you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was just like, I don't know. When I found the guitar, it was like, I found everything I'd ever been looking for. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. Well said, well said. Let me ask you this, oh, Play, yeah. playing approach. Uh huh. None of those guys that you mentioned, I mean, some of them did in certain parts, but like, how did the no pick thing come about for the approach, especially like with the Stevie Ray, where it's like heavy pick, you know, the side of the pick, not the point, but like, how did that come about? Of course we have Jeff Beck right. and, and some other players, but like the first one that comes to mind is like Jeff Beck, no pick. Yes. Um, dude, how does that, how did that even get, where did that even come from? How did that even start? So check this out. So I'm a lefty. Naturally? Um, yes. Like you write with your I left hand. I write with my left hand. Okay. Everything I do, whether it's like holding the steering wheel or a fork or drinking, whatever, I'm like a lefty. Wow. Yeah. So when I picked up a guitar, I wanted to hold it lefty. And I remember mm. that my guitar, when, when my parents bought me my first guitar, it came with a free like, you know, intro to guitar lesson, how to hold your guitar, what the strings were called, you yeah. know. And uh, I walked in, I was holding it like a lefty. Okay. And my first guitar teacher goes, hold on, you flip the guitar, and he puts it, you know, and I'm like, okay. And then he goes, okay, this is your fretting hand, this is your picking hand. And I remember instantly when he did that, I started to strum the strings with my fingers because the easiest way to put it, when I play the guitar, I like to feel the string under my finger, just like on your fretting hand when you, when you play, I can feel that, the vibration. When I strike it, I wanna feel. So. When I first started though, he goes, no, you're playing with a pick. Can I grab one of these picks? Yeah, yeah, okay. I was hoping you yeah, would, because yeah. I'm really curious to see. So yeah. it started and I had the pick, but since I'm a lefty, I never felt like I could really get it in. And I remember the first lick I learned was. And I was like, yeah, cool. But then my friends would start to play like fast stuff. And I never could like, I couldn't get that, you know? So when I got into Stevie, I was like, all right, I'm gonna use a pick because Stevie uses a pick. Yes. So I was using these super fat picks, right? And when I play, I would, you know, I'm gonna make fun of myself. I, it's hard to play with a pick. But I noticed if I use the pick in my finger, it was like, okay, well, there's a little... So going down with the pick, up with the finger. Right. Then I started to do this thing where I'd put the pick there, right? Okay. And I started to. And then, because everyone said, hey, you're not gonna be a professional guitar player unless you use a pick. What? So I'd always have okay. it. And then I remember I was like 17 going on 18 and I did not have a guitar pick on me and I had to play a gig. So I was like, I'll just try and use my fingers. And the first thing I noticed, there was a lot of stuff that was hard, but I went, well, if my thumb always goes down like a pick and then I can pull up with my index, middle and ring. I kind of have a thing. And then I have to, you know, really adjust my attack. But then I started to, someone's like, how are you gonna play rhythm? And I was like, well. <laughs> like, well, that already sounds pretty good. Sure. And then uh, I, I just kind of fine tuned it, but it's a very simple way that I'm playing. And like, like you said, how did that start? I think it's because I was a lefty and I never okay. felt fully comfortable with the pick. And then I didn't have anyone to teach me finger style like this. Mm. So all those hours that I was sitting there trying to learn how to play and you know figuring stuff out, I just started to make up kind of my own, my own vibe. Wow. Yeah. I wasn't missing anything when you switched over to the hand just now. Like totally. I, I didn't hear anything where it was like, oh, we should have had the pick there or something. Like well, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. To go off on a tangent now a little bit is with the fingers, there's so much um, nuancey stuff and so much expression. I feel like I get out of that compared to a pick, right? Right, So right. the way that I attack the string, how much, you know, like, a and the volume is very low, but.
I feel right. like there's a different sensitivity. It's more personal there. Yeah, and yeah. when I play like those blues licks, right? When I, when I was playing like a... But I had to figure out different stuff like, okay, well, how do I make a, for instance, a pinch harmonic, you know? So when I'm up... So how's that happening? You have to hit some something else has to hit the string. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm using my thumb almost like a bass player, and I'm holding it. I can hold it. I gotta do the old Billy Gibbons like. But you know, it's like chicken picking stuff. There's a lot of That's different great. stuff that I felt like I could maybe incorporate into my playing. Maybe even if I didn't like stylistically grow up trying to chicken pick. Yeah. Adding it with this technique felt cool. No, that's great. And I, again, didn't miss anything there. Yeah. The harmonic thing was like my my one question where I was like, how is that happening yeah, yeah, without yeah. that pick? And a lot of that right hand, I mean, man, the right hand is just so killer where it's like, you know, a lot of legato's happening as well. Oh yeah. But man, that's the that's the one thing I was always wondering. And you know, a lot of you at home may not see this the way that I'm seeing it, but like, it's not you're not heavy-handed. Not at all. Really, no. um, you would think that I was really smashing and raking yeah. into the strings, and that has its own effect too. And um, that's really cool, especially when you're you like I have like the world's fattest guitar picks when I'm. <laughs> Snap it I up. mean, I, if I wasn't looking, I would be like, yeah, he's, you know, yeah, I wouldn't even think about it. That's and, great. And then another cool thing that I always do is like I can use three fingers. So like, let's say it's like kind of a roll, right? Where yeah. it's like G, B, and E string. I could, right? As I bring that up, I could go, you know. Roll it around the strings. Um, you can do weird licks like uh, turn on a little more gain and I can do like a That's great. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have any rules when I play guitar. Like, I just have fun. It, it sounds like it. I mean, it, it looks like it. <laughs> uh, so, I want to point out something real quick. I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always a fan of trying to, you know, myself and so many other players out there, we're in the blue, I tend to be in the blues box and I, you know, uh, my theory is is somewhat in the medium range. Yeah. And so I haven't memorized like, you know, every place on the fretboard, but like one of the things that I'll get stuck in and I noticed that you uh, can get out of is like, if you're in like, let's say a G pentatonic. Yeah. Um, and I'm just sticking to the pentatonic here, right? But like, mm -hmm. sometimes trying to get out of that though, yeah. like trying to do where it's like, Yeah, some of the stuff that you were doing, like to get us out of that box, like right. what would you say, like is a cool, like couple of go-to licks or boxes to where, like, if you want to just get out of that for a second and it sounds a little fancier. Well, the one thing I always say is it's like, um, it's like taking, like making your own versions of the pentatonic scale, yeah, or like adding to it or subtracting to it, yeah, is a really simple way. First off, where you can kind of break that mold. So, for instance, I would always think to myself, there's a sound in my head that I'm trying to get out. But when I play my pentatonics, I don't hear it, right? Yeah. So not to get too deep like into the theory stuff, but yeah. like if I'm in G, right? Cool. So we have just like a blues. Well, what if I want to start incorporating the third, right? Adding the fourth fret, which is the third of G, which is a B. I'm I, like, this is like the, uh, I feel like the street way to look at it, yeah. but it's like, if I start to go, you know. It's like, well, what was that? Well, technically, theoretically, it was like mixolydian, right? Right. But all I was really thinking about was, okay, I have this pentatonic, you know, I could play right here. So I start to, instead of playing this minor third, which is, you know, if I want to, 
cool, right? But if I add the So then cool. I start cool. to um, add that in and it's like, okay, don't hit any minor thirds, only hit the, uh, the major third and we start to And then bending in. So check this out, you can do like, I'm such a fan of bending. I'm a total nerd about right. it. But when, when I hear someone that has control over their bending and their intonation, that to me is the most deadly thing on a guitar player. Mm -hmm. Because you can play so little and say so much. Right. So for instance, now if I wanna take that a step further, what if I start to almost do a half step or almost microtonal bending into that third? Love and then it. we start to, you know, like a. And now you're not even talking about adding like the open G string underneath it. You could start to. Um, now that's a B, because since the B is the third there too. And then I start to almost try and think like, if you took your pentatonics and you started to do that where you add one note or add a tone to it, you can start to think like you're singing. Right. And that's what I start to do. So I start to hear like, a, like if I go like a, I hear that in my head, you know what I mean? And I feel like when I do that, it makes me feel more in control of what I'm playing. Yeah. So there's two things. And then the third thing I was gonna say, if you're trying to get out of the box, would be what's really cool, and I like to mess around with it, is kind of adding this jazzy slide, like you started to do it where you could. Right? It sounds really simple, but yeah. All of a sudden you're like, what was that? Yet again, I went minor, like pure minor there, right? So I. I added the second mm. of the minor. You go half steps. I, That's great. It's anything you want. And you know, you're still kind of in the same area. Totally. And I love what you did there with the, um, the you know, the... Um, Like that alone already is like spicing that whole thing up. You if know? you want to do something really weird too, I, I always mess around with this. Like we all play an E minor pentatonic, right? Yep. So there's something I like to do up there. Like let's say we're in that box up there and I can start to do what we were just doing. I... What if I want to get weirder? I'll start to add weird sound. So yeah, it's still over. Love it. Kind of cool. Love it. I love it. And it just pushes it outside the realm there. I love mm -hmm. that, you know? And I think that's kind of like what, you know, we all want to strive for and hear, uh, you know, because we're taking from the, the, the heroes of yesterday and kind of adding a little bit of the, that in there. It's like, I don't want to say modified blues, but it's almost like a yeah. modern take on it in a way, is and that approach, you know? I think a lot of players um, could wholesomely agree that playing our favorite players' licks it's awesome and it's so gratifying. Yeah. And like when you nail them, you're like, yes. But there's something really cool about taking licks that you learn or ideas or concepts and then just kind of shifting them in your own way. And you know, it, it just takes you somewhere else that's a little different. It's on the same path, Yeah. but uh, but it's just cool. Well, it sounded like you too right there. Yeah. Like it sounded like, yeah, I mean, there's some licks where it's like, of course, I mean, how can we get out of something that sounds like, you know, someone, someone before us 
there's only so much you can, you know, reinvent the wheel. Totally. But that right there, it's like I could hear you playing, and I've heard you play some stuff like that, where it's like, again, it, it, it catapults you outside of the traditional, and it's like now you're cutting edge, you and, know? And, you know, like, I, we could sit here all day and talk about different concepts, but really the, the reality is just don't limit yourself to what um, what is preconceived as, okay, I have it, I'm there. I've always found a lick, even the simplest lick, yeah. if, it's, if it's the simplest lick, like a... How do I take that lick and do a million things to it? Yes. You know? Right? Big fan of that. Yeah. Turn, Big fan of doing that. Yes. Different stuff or like turning down, you know. Um, I mean, I could sit here and just do a million things. Yeah. I'm still thinking around that lick. And or like you've only got two strings. Yeah. And there's only like, okay, there's only three notes or I got to stay on these two strings in that key and like how many things can I do with it? That's a great way to be practicing stuff for sure. Absolutely. Just just have fun with it and uh, really take, take the time to find your tone, your touch and your feel and work around that because I feel like that kind of set me free. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. could, that, great, great. Because the, the hard part is like, the first thing I would think of is like, okay, we all got to go out there and learn all the scales and all yeah. the different places to play G, but then it's like, okay, well, then it's the application of like, well, when mm -hmm. do I land in what area? When yeah. do I have the setup? And, totally. you know, and like, when am I going to use the, the third in, you know, the third inversion of the pentatonic scale? Yeah. And then by that point, it's like, did I have fun just now? Or <laughs> did I even solo? I don't know, because I was too busy thinking. Well, we know? were talking about it earlier too, and I think there's a big thing with players where sometimes we get in our own head so much that nothing comes out right. Right, right. And you can sit there, and I used to be a victim of it, seriously. Like, I would sit there and warm up for hours before a show. Yes. Thinking of every possible different thing that I could do on the guitar. And I go out to the show, and I would be in my own head so much that nothing was really coming out right. Yeah. And then there would be times when, you know, I'd get to a show, and we're late. Come on, plug in, let's go, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I'm so excited, there's such a rush that I, I play and I'm like, oh, it feels fresh, it feels exciting. Right. And I think there's a lot of kind of mental um, blocks that we put inside ourselves when we play guitar. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm never gonna be good enough, I'm never gonna do this, the my think, tone, you know. The thinking game is, is, I think there's more of it now too, because, you know, now that this is a great trans, uh, you know, transfer into um, where we're about to go with the gear thing. Mm -hmm. And besides the gear thing too, like, you know, there's days where I'm playing guitar and I'm playing and I'm like staring at my amps and my pedals. Oh yeah. And then I'm like, my wife will come and be like, dude, you've been playing the same thing like <laughs> over and over again. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm just listening to... I'm trying to hear the different, yeah. And then there's days where I just like put on a Zeppelin record or something and then I just go to town and yep. then I'm like, oh, I didn't even step on anything. Like yeah. I just played like the straight, you know, uh, guitar into amp. So it's like, you know, part of the reason why, you know, I think it's important when we talk to all these different artists and it's like, we, we have these interviews where it's like, I really want to break down to people where it's like, man, just just do it. Like, just like, don't like get ca too caught up out of it, but like, you know, fi find what you like and like, well, man. just hit it, you know? So I'm gonna watch your toes. I'm about to name drop really hard. Okay. I've been so lucky to play so many legendary guitars. Yeah. Everything from Greeny to Eddie Van Halen stuff to Obviously, Bonamassa stuff, Jimmy yeah. Page. I've played Hendrix's guitars. I've played Albert Woo. King's guitar. I've been so lucky to play so much stuff. And um, not only just play it like, oh, cool, but have time with it. And, you know, yeah. like I got to record with some of Hendrix's stuff. And wow. it was like crazy. So the thing that I noticed, though, whenever I'd plug into their stuff, I still sounded like me. Yes. So that there's a huge thing, like, with the gear where I got to play um, for an afternoon. I had Eddie's, one of Eddie's Kramer's that you know, he had modified and done himself. And um, there's a video online of this. But I got to sit with that guitar like all day, right? Oh, okay, wow. And uh, all I'm saying is I still sounded like me. Right. I didn't sound like Eddie. Right, And well, yeah. yeah, with gear, it's like we were saying before, there's, there's a lot of um, preconceived things where you think, okay, if I get this, I'm gonna get here. But the, I feel like it's all in your hands, it's in your heart, it's in, you know, not to get, crazy but it's like what is burning inside of you yeah that's what you're going to get out through whether it's an epiphone les paul mm -hmm. or it's like whatever it is that it's what's inside of you that comes out that's what makes it special right you know it's funny your rig is here today yep. i want to walk through that and some of the guitars now at this time but do you think your rig changes drastically like 
because you don't play with the pick, like, do you think the, the tone changes quite a bit and you would have to, like, dial things around and differently because the switch between the two? Oh, for sure. Like, like I don't know if it would translate here, but even if I hit, like, an A chord, right? And I go... <laughs> Hit it a little hard there, but it's. And then when I hit with my hands, there's a yes. lot more of a uh, lower mid range, right? Yeah. But with if people play my rig, they'll I think they would notice right away that they, if they had a pick, they would go, "Oh, this doesn't." I, I often find people that come jam with me. Yeah. They put their pick down because they're like, "No, I'm going to try it like this." Yeah. You know? the, it, there is a different tone. There's a different vibe, and um, I just think like the everything's different it's like my hands are different than your hands sure. and i feel like that plays such how much you're using the mute there's just yeah, the so EQ much you just changed from yes. that and like yeah i agree like if you if i were to switch with you right now like i know for a fact the eq will change 100 percent. not even just the like playing style but like yeah you know what i mean like this this might sound darker this might sound might sound brighter because of just the way we attack and stuff totally you brought some tasty pieces here. Uh, Thanks, man. Let's go first. Okay, so obviously this is one of the early uh, yes. uh, signature models. So I brought a bunch of different guitars. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to do is these are the guitars. Uh, this one, this is the first prototype wow. uh, that they sent me in tw uh, 2018. I remember it was like the happiest day of my life when I, this guitar showed up. This is the Old Glory prototype. This guitar has been all over the world. Wow. It um, has seen, it's been in like probably 30 different countries. I didn't even know it would get that color. That's, oh yeah, I don't know that, what color look at is that. that tail piece. I don't know if you guys <laughs> can see that, but like I can tell that's been played a lot. This has been replaced like three or four times. No way. Just, oh. You know, and, and I'll like crack them or whatever. Um, but this guitar, man, it's it still holds strong. Wow. But I wanted to bring this one because it's a true testament as a player. It's got the Grover tuners. Yeah. Grover tuners. Yeah. But like, if you put this up against a, another one, you can see how uh, yellowed it's gotten, mm, which is hilarious. Nice. But this is a testament to this guitar. It's it's an absolute beast of a guitar. I pulled this out of the case this morning. I hadn't played it in probably six months, and I just tuned it before we played. And it sounds great. It sounds great. It sounds great. It's uh, it's a, a big milestone for me as a player. This guitar right here. So it's a near near and dear. Yeah. No. Yeah. That that is is uh, sleek looking. That's great. Yeah, and, man. And the other ones next to it are. Uh, is it the same guitar, just different colors, right? So actually, with this one right here, which mm -hmm. is the Gold Glory, yeah, that um has a few little upgrades to it. It has a Seymour Duncan USA antiquity pickup. Oh, okay, so, cool. So the pickup, um, it has the more. It has the CTS pots in it. So just a little bit more of an upgrade on the electronics. Sure. Um, same neck, same, same neck. feel. Um, this is like the double gold, gold glory. We got yeah. the gold glory, we yeah. got gold glory. That's the one I'm familiar with. Yes. Um, and then what's up with the blue over there? We got a blue one right here. So the okay. blue one is, this is something special that's getting cooked up. It's uh, It's got a lot of different stuff on it. What's cool about this one is, it's kind of the uh, 3.0 version, I mean, it has a Seymour Duncan pickup in it. That's a signature model to me, which nice. is really cool. Locking tuners, which just with these guitars, like I do so much dumb stuff to these guitars. Like I'll do like, you know, uh, and I'll do all these weird bending and, you know, I'll try and do these bends. And I feel like with this thing, with locking tuners, it just like, it steps it up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It goes from being like a, a car with like, Disc brakes on the front to all around. It's like go and you're for it. not having to wind as many uh, winds around the post. Not at all. It's just through the whole tight and you lock it and that's it. And when I break a string, it's like okay, cool, boom, boom, twisted. That's my brain. favorite thing about the locking for sure. Yes. Just clicker on that. And I think I'm not. I, I have to kind of go back to this tech moment here. Where it's like I think with the less winds, I think you get like a cleaner angle as well. It's not like further down on the post. I totally believe that. Nut. Um, no, that's great. That, that's, that's a nice color. And yeah. yeah, the Pelham Blue, and then obviously the Double Gold, and then the classic just black. And why the single P90 and not two? So check this out. You were talking about um, my rig, and do I have to adjust for my fingers? Do I have to adjust between a pick, right? Yeah. One thing that I keep doing, and I've always been a really fan of, like just being a minimalist. Mm. And just in a world of so much 
especially in the guitar world where it's like we could have 100 pedals and every single feature on our guitars. What I started to find is years ago when I started my trio, when I started to actually play out live, when I was touring, I would build a pedal board or I would have a guitar and things would fall apart on it. You know, like mm. I'd be like, oh, let me put in this, uh, this coil tap. And like three days in, it's like, <sighs> it's not working, you know? Mm. So when I started messing with this, the thing that I noticed first off, being a fingerstyle player, not having a neck pickup there really um, gave me room. So it's freedom. Yeah, it was and freedom. it's just not in the way. Yeah, that makes sense. And I remember I, I used to snap my, I don't use my fingernails, but mm. I used to pull up on that and I would you know, snap off my fingernails and stuff. So I took that out. Okay. And also we were talking about the tonal difference. Well, with a bridge pickup, using your fingers, I feel like I'm a huge proponent of the volume and tone knob. Yeah, okay. So, so for instance, if I play. And like for a lick, right? There you go. Just stacks so, up. Yeah. Levels. And then with the tone, you know. All the way back, bring it up a little bit. And then the world in between that, you know, and then yeah. I thought to myself, well, if I'm down at like four or five on my neck or on my um, tone knob, I get that quasi neck sound. So I'm a big proponent of that. And it's like with P90s, you have to be quick on the draw because they're buzzy. So I noticed you were very, you're very quick on the draw when, when talking and playing. Oh man, I'm like, if I'm not playing the volume will, will I noticed that very quickly. Like you're like, okay, so is this all happening while we're singing? Yeah, oh yeah. While we're singing, this is all happening. Oh yeah, this is like, uh, while I'm singing, while I'm thinking about a million other things on stage, whatever, yeah. um, I'm always riding. And even during a solo, even during a lick, I'll do things where, you know, I'll, I'll hit something, I'll, I'll literally go from a, you know. There's so much that I do. I love that with the tone. Oh yeah. I, I want to call that out real quick. Um, <laughs> if you don't know, a lot of you probably do, but there's some that don't. And uh, a wah pedal is basically like a big potentiometer or like a big, you know, treble pot almost. And you're just using that with your foot. It's a little bit more, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit stronger than what's probably in there. But at the same time, like that's really what's happening with the tone yeah. knob if you, can, if you can do it right. Well, you could do like the, And then you can do like a Love it. Weird. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Killer. Yeah, Killer. Cool. So now that uh, that is going into uh, you're missing 97 pedals, by the way. You mentioned I know, 100. I know. That is the smallest, most lethal board I have seen in a very long time. Thanks, man. Now I've seen you with some other pedals, yeah. but when you brought this out today. I was like, holy smokes. Uh, yep. You brought nothing but the best there. You've got a, 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 tu a Vemoran Edition Tube Screamer, yep. which I think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's very amp-like, yes. got a lot of headroom, mm -hmm. sweet sounding, mm -hmm. a lot of harmonic content. Mm -hmm. Simple polytune tuner with the buffer in it. Yep. Great. Yep. And then, of course, a Klon Centaur. Yes, sir. I mean, and that stays on the Klon. So you are it's funny because I was talking about how I like to minimalize my gear as much as possible. Yeah. So I do have another board that has a few other things, um, a Vibe pedal and Octavia. A gypsy Vibe, I think, right? Uh, the, uh, the, um, or, the Funky uh, Vibe. Funky Vibe, sorry, yeah. Funky Vibe. No, no, so, so what I started to do though is I would have these fly dates. Okay. And I would be hauling this pedal board and I'd be checking it at security and I'd be watching them throw the Pelican Air as hard as they can and I would, get a pedal back and it'd have a knob broken or, you know what I mean? Oh, right. I get to the show and I was like, man. Shoot, even in the Pelican case? Yeah. Oh man. So what I what I started to do is I, I have a backpack okay. because if a flight can get canceled, it will get canceled or mm -hmm. bags will get missing. I said, I'm putting this gotcha. in my backpack. It's with you. Yeah, so it's with me, my guitar's with me. But besides that, like you'd said, the Vemaram, let's start with the Klon. 
So this clom is a gift from Joe Bonamassa. Wow. Yeah. So I I I had one that I was borrowing for a very long time from a friend of mine, Big D. Mm -hmm. And the the moment I got that pedal, I knew something was going on. Mm -hmm. Pretty special with it. And um, I was so lucky and fortunate to spend like two years with that pedal. And what ended up happening was we people started to know that I played it. It's worth quite a bit of money. Yeah. Someone tried to steal it. No. Yeah. So then I was like, I'm not touring with a clon anymore, especially something that mm. is not mine. So I gave Big D his clon back, and I instantly had the regret. I was like, oh, man. What? So I tried a bunch of different stuff. You did? Yeah. You tried the KTR? I tried all that stuff. Yeah. We, we, uh, it's a tough one. I mean, there, there's definitely some fairy dust in there or something. Well, I don't know. And then I hit up Joe, and I was like, hey, man, there was a clon for sale. And I said, I don't think this is real. Can you look at it? He goes, that's not real. Wow. And he goes, well, if you want a clon, he's like, I can hook you up with one, and I'll, you can just buy it for what I paid for it. And I was like, okay, cool. This is a testament to how cool Joe is. Yes. Um, so I go, and I get the pedal that day. He's on the road. He has one of his friends drop it off to me or whatever. And uh, I get the pedal, and I'm like, yep, there it is. That's the sound. And I hit him up like a week later, and I'm like, hey, let me know how I can pay you for this pedal. You sure. Know, what do I owe you? And he goes, and I'm on tour at this point. And he goes, oh, dude. No, just use the money for your tour. Pedal's a gift. Wow. He goes, I that is so awesome. He's like, I'd rather have you playing it and playing the real thing. Yes. You know, so that's a testament to Joe. And I was like, you, I can't believe that. That is but awesome. What I could say, uh, long and short about the clone, I could sit and talk about it all day. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed is a lot of players like to use it as a, uh, like a clean boost. Yes. So without it, we have this, right? Cool. Well, if I turn that down, the gain all the way down. But I'm kind of a psycho, so I run that thing with the gain because I like the way it clips. Yeah. So I put the gain up maybe halfway. I just use my ear every day. Even more, most people don't even know what a clon sounds like with the gain all the way up. Right. So I use it about halfway. Love it. And then when I got this, I got this from a, a friend of mine, Tyler, and I knew that this was a great, the Vemoram Tube Screamer. Yes. I love Tube Screamers, grew mm -hmm. up with them, like we talked about with Stevie. Yeah. But when I got this, what I noticed was when I put that pedal on, it actually raised the volume. I heard it out front. I was playing this uh, theater overseas. Right. And I heard it and I was like, whoa. Like it actually brought the level up. You're talking about this one. Yeah. Yeah, that one has a lot of headroom. It, mm -hmm. It's incredible. So when I played that, you know, and, and I'll run it maybe, I'll just, because with P90s, you know, things can get pretty buzzy, but I'll, I'll, I'll run it with very low gain, but stacking that with the clon. <laughs> So <laughs> I don't hear it getting muddy. Right. I don't hear it getting squashed. Yep. Usually when you stack stuff, you know, it, it gets like a little squashy and like mm -hmm. it does this like thickening thing where you can't hear the the the, uh, the the highs. Yeah. I don't hear any of that happening. It's very smooth. And like remember out there, even though you've got the gain up and you've got that thing on the whole time on already a dirty amp, mm -hmm. uh, 
remember, you know, for everyone watching, it's like you are using the volume on the guitar all the time to control that from this angle, from this aspect as well. So all the that's time. why that works, especially uh, for you as well. And like, if I hit that, I just put the gain up a little bit more on that Vemoram. So now the gain on the Klon is like up over, like more than anyone would probably ever think to use. So. <laughs> Tasty, just super tasty. I, I, yeah. I, 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 they work real well with each other. Now that's going into your, uh, that's your signature Black Star amp there. Yep. yep, that's my signature Black Star that came out and right when this guitar came out, actually, yeah. 2019. And this is a great 20 watt. Um, basically, it's it's like I call it like the Swiss Army knife. I, I take that thing everywhere. Yeah. And. Uh, it just does what I want it to. Yeah. And it's yeah. and I get to throw it around and it still works. And that just stays on one setting. Yeah. There's that no just two stays channels on or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. What happens when you go do like a backline? Is there ever like a situation oh, where there's yeah. a backline amp? Well, I'll I'll do things like that all the time and mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I'll either get stuck with a, a twin, right? Okay. And then what's great about this rig is like if I crank that twin enough and I can stack these together, I can basically get Get something pretty get good. Get something there, at least you're If it's covered. a Marshall or if it's a Vox or something like that, I, I, I've i been versed enough with those amps where it's like, as long as it makes sound, we'll make we'll make it work. Well, you, know? You, you, you know your bass that you're looking for. Exactly. Like if I can get something close, I mean, the gain is gonna change probably mm -hmm. and, and maybe the treble and, and the sometimes the amp, the output's not, is gonna maybe be more or less, right? Yeah, and the, the, the only other thing I'll say, this is getting super nerdy about tone. Yeah. The thing that I've noticed a lot now since I spend a lot of time, like, I've been doing like a lot of like different session stuff, mm -hmm. but I'll be playing through all these different amps, different guitars, and the thing that I noticed the most that I never, ever, ever thought about growing up, or even until like this year, was how the guitar and how the amp hits, where it is, like, like there's amps that sag, right? So mm -hmm. you hit it and then it comes out, yep. or if you're really on top of it, is it does it have a really quack to the top? You know, when, basically, is it a percussive sounding rig? Is it the, you know, is your guitar, it's like the reaction time. Yes. So there's rigs that I'll play where I'm like, man, why am I, why do I feel like I'm behind or I'm struggling a little bit? Right. And what I notice is with like this rig, like P90, Rap Tail, Les Paul, through these, these overdrives, the reaction time's instant. So when I play something, like if I go, there's that percussive click at the top. Sometimes you'll play a rig and it won't have that, or you know, especially something for me with like a humbucker. So what I'm noticing a lot now is how everything translates together to get out of the speaker. Mm, so right. I know that sounds maybe really crazy. No, I think the easiest way that I could even break that down further is some amps uh, have a quick response mm -hmm. and some amps have a slow response. Mm -hmm. The ones that have the, the quick response you know, I mean, I've noticed amps that have a sag, it's a little bit easier. Yep. It depends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little bit easier, but then there is the touch sensitivity that's lacking. Yes. Uh, like if I play like a, we'll call it a D style amp, yeah. where it's just, there's no give and it's just like, you give me what you want to give me and, and I'm just going to sit here and do my thing. And yep. it's like very high fidelity kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I have noticed that like I'll have to work a little bit harder, or I don't even want to say it that way, but like you're a little bit more like, it's working with you mm -hmm. as opposed to against you. It, it's the difference between the two amps, right? Absolutely. I think it's like if you were driving a car and if you hit a car, if you hit the pedal and it, you instantly get taken back, right? Yeah. Or sometimes it's like, yeah. it's just the reaction time. Right. Which as a player can really almost mess with you. Maybe you're not even thinking about it, but you're like, but this feels different. You know, do you think the pedals help when you go to a rig that's not yours? Like, do you think Absolutely. having those pedals help? Yeah, it does. And it's not just because, you know, they're they're what they are. I think having a familiarity as a player, even with this, you know, this guitar, it's like it having something in a bass where it's like, OK, cool. I don't know the rig. I don't know the amp, but I have my pedal. Yeah. And I have my guitar. It just helps. Over here to my right, uh -oh. I feel like these things are like giving me the side eye or something. <laughs> and like, I really, they've been like, you guys gonna talk about yeah, it? Yeah, so what, over here? We're over here. 
What's going on here? I'm going to hand these over to you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to hand these over because, dude, what is happening here? You brought these in and uh -huh. I, I almost like lost it. it yeah. Dude, tell me, what's going on here? So Look at this. this guitar. Look at that. Yeah. So feast your eyes, people. This is a very special guitar. This is my first old guitar ever. Okay. I got this in 2019 from one of my best buddies, Charlie Daughtry. Yeah. Charlie runs the Les Paul Forum. Oh. He's a very, very, very long time Gibson collector okay. and player. We hooked up in Houston. I was playing a show and he said, come over and check out my guitar collection. I walk in and I'm like, he's like, here's a 59, here's this, you know. He had this and this is um, a late 1953. So this is just after the Wait. trapeze. Okay. Um, so it has a thin ear tailpiece. So like on a wrap tail, usually it's like a pretty thick around the post. Mm -hmm. This is very thin. Nice. So it's a very early wrap tail Les Paul. But as you can see, I don't know if it's picking it up. This has obviously been painted over a very, very long time ago. You can see the gold from the gold top. No way. I can see that. Right. Yep. You can see it down here. Yes. You can see it basically wherever... What I love about this, I feel like this is a, first off, before you even hear it, it's a thing of beauty. Yes. Because it's this crazy aged red where you can see all of the checking from the red. But then underneath you can see that it was played. If you really look at it, there's someone's mark. Mm. You know, uh, the back was refinished black. And in the collector world, this guitar might be kind of looked at like, oh, it's just a refin or an overspray. Oh, you know? right, right, right. But as a player, come on. It's got vibe. It's got all the it's vibe. And the I remember vibe. I picked this guitar up and I looked at Charlie and we both nodded and he goes, you might want to take that one with you. Yeah. And Charlie hooked me up with this guitar on a ridiculous, ridiculous deal. Uh, I am also noticing the neck has got some cool wear. Oh, yeah. Uh, What's going to be great is that you're going to see more of that gold probably pop out the more you play it. The right? more I play it, yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. This guitar is really special to me because um, right here you can see it says Jim, right? My dad was born in 1953. And the last time I saw him, I had him carve his name on it. No and, way. Uh, so I said, now, you know, he's, he's part of the guitar. That's awesome. Um, so most people would look at that and be like, why would you do that? And I was like, well, I'm never going to sell it. No, you know, it's this got a is story too. It's got the great story. And yeah. So, yeah. But now, uh, this is all original. Okay, um, I was gonna ask. Yeah, all plastics. original. Okay, everything besides the paint. Sure, is original. Great. Yeah, I see the switch tip is even still there. Oh, oh man, yeah, it's funny because you could even see the paint on the side of the P90. Oh yeah, this was they like didn't even like take the hardware off to paint it. No, dude, this is like a <laughs> this is a total like garage paint. Yes, job. but it's it's funny with these guitars too. Most maybe players would be like, man, you know. I don't know. Is it going to be solid? I remember when I first started touring with the guitar mm. because I feel like all this stuff. It was made for a reason to be played. Yeah. Um, especially something like this. Like, it has a lot of music left in it. And I was nervous at first, though, because I, I thought to myself, am I going to be able to tour with this guitar? Right, like, is it going right, to hold right, up? Right. So I said to Charlie, I said, hey, man, should I, like, get different tuners? Mm -hmm. And he was like, what are you talking about? He's like, it's been on this planet for 70 years. I see. You yes, know, it's like, yes. just, just play it. Yeah. Just let it do its thing. And, man, talk about an absolute killer. It is just fantastic. The, this one especially, I'll say this because I have another one to show you, but the neck pickup on this guitar is specifically, um, it, it takes over everything. Okay. So check this out. Let, yeah. me, let me give it a little. Here. So here's the, um, I didn't even tune it, so hopefully it's done tune. That's the bridge, straight wow. up. Check wow. out this neck pickup. Yeah. 
That's all red. Wow. That sounds like it looks. The neck pickup screams just as much as the bridge can. Yeah. Imagine this at like concert stage volume. Yes. It just starts to do its own thing. Wow. The guitars are. Man. And that, yeah, that is special. It uh, Again, like it's so, I don't know how else to say it, but like it sounds like what I thought. Like it sounds like what it looks like. It's It tells a story and like the neck. It. Oh yeah. The neck pick, again, like when you went to the neck, I did not admit, like it was just as good. Like uh, um, the. Um... <laughs> You didn't do anything to the tones. The tones were wide open on the tones guitar. were wide open. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's a wrap right there. That yep. that's that's good to go. The so. next one I'm going to show you. Yes. I think Let me grab personally that guy. has um, even crazier stories. So check this out. Yeah. This guitar has a crazy story. This guitar is named Dorothy. Okay. This is a really really early 1952. Um, it was given to me by a fan. No way. So check this out. Wow. This guitar was in a tornado. Oh, it was okay. found in his front yard after the tornado without a neck. Hence the name Dorothy. Yes. Now so I get it. when it, it was a message online and it was like tap to view images blurred. And I, he's like, hey, man, I know you like old Les Pauls. It's my friend TJ. And he goes, um, check out this guitar that landed in my front yard. So I hit him back instantly. It was this body full of mud. There was shards of glass and asphalt in it especially on the back. Wow. And there was even this film over it that, because he hadn't cleaned it, and this happened in 2013, this tornado. Mm. He hadn't cleaned it, so it didn't really look, I was like, what is that? But what it did have that I know, it had, ob obviously, this is all original, never been out of the guitar. Okay. Um, this pickup right here, which has the two, basically basically the, the side screws. Yeah, what's up with that? So the first run of Les Paul's had those. Oh, okay. And that's the only run that had those. Um, and it is right away. I was like, oh, that's an early 52. Mm, mm. Now there's been different numbers that I've heard anywhere between 25 to hundred. Okay. So check this out. So I hit him up and we're talking about it and he says, I might want to get it restored. And I said, Hey man, uh, if you need any help with anything, just let me know. I said, and also if you'd ever consider selling it, I would love to get a neck on it and play it. He calls me a few days later and he goes, Hey man, I didn't buy this guitar. I'm not going to sell it. And just for a disclaimer, the owner was found. It was her dad's guitar. She claimed down her insurance. She told him, hang it on your wall. It's not a guitar anymore. It's a broken, you know? Mm. So I sent this guitar. I met up with TJ and he gave it to me. And I, I pleaded with him, please let me give you something for this guitar. Mm. And he wouldn't. Wow. And I sent this guitar to my friend J Joel at JW Restoration in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And he hand cut the neck. This is crazy old Brazilian rosewood. It was all hand done. He saved the, the heel of the back and basically grafted the new neck onto this old heel, took the old heel out and like forensic filed it. Like crazy. I mean, it, cause I was gonna say the neck, uh, from looking at the back right now, it doesn't look like that. Like it, he did a great job on kind of getting it to match mm -hmm. pretty, pretty good there. You and know? we wanted to make sure that we weren't trying to fool anyone. Right. And say, hey, you know, this is an, it's like this guitar has a crazy story. It does. And Joel wanted to represent all of the, the bumps and bruises and obviously the, the damage. So I told him, he said, how much do you want me to clean? I said, I only want it to be playable. Mm -hmm. I want it to be everything else it can be. So check this out. Joel gets the guitar and mm -hmm. he goes, hey, you know how old this guitar is? I said, well, early 52. He goes, the pots are from 1951. Wow. And I was like, okay, so it's very early. He goes, the body's thicker than a normal 52 standard. Mm. Okay, so the really early ones, they had a thicker body. It's got a two-piece flame maple top. Underneath? Yeah. Hmm. And he said that the originals, if you look up the, the first batch, that's what they had. And you can start to kind of see it if you look at it in the right direction. If you, but it's got 
there's some flame there. Yeah. And oh, oh, yep, yep. I can see it pop in a little bit on this area there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we started to kind of understand that this was a very early Les Paul. Very, very mm -hmm. early. With the routes in the back, the way that some things are cut. Yeah. It's just so cool because, you know, this guitar was never to be played again. And we resurrected it. And when, when I got the guitar, I had no reservation if it was going to sound good or not. Okay. So I went, eh, it'll probably be cool. Sure. And I played it at this, I plugged it in. Joel said I did not look at the electronics at all. The electronics have never been touched. This wow. thing had been in a tornado. This is exactly how I played this out. And yet again, I'm not even gonna tune it. I went and I plugged it in and I just went like this. I went, it works. I was like, okay. I checked this pickup. Okay, it works. So I started on the neck and I remember I went. Okay, the volume's at two. All right, it's pretty quiet. That's volume at five. Here's all the way up. Okay, let's hear this bridge, right? Nineteen fifty one electronics. I don't wow. know if they ever thought they'd sound like that. Yeah. Wow. This one, it's like it's like velvety, like it's like creamy, it's like mm -hmm. smooth in a way, you know. It, uh, did, was this pickup? Did you have to lower this, or was it like that? It was like, like that. Okay, because the balance is like spot on. Yeah, it's it's it was exactly as you see it, and and this one, like going back to the playing stuff, like this one, I could I could sit and play it like a, um, you know, like I could go like. <laughs> Creamy, just rich. I mean, man. And then this patina here on the gold, <laughs> like the seeing that. Mm -hmm. And then the story about just telling me, like, they're just, just seeing the little flame pop out of there too. I mean, that wow. What what a find and what a story. I mean, that that's that's just great. This is from my fingers. Okay. From pulling up. This is from my pinky. So what's cool about this one? Too, this is from your pinky. Uh huh. Wow. So you can see it on that one, old one too. Oh, no way, right there on the so, uh, side of the bridge there. Yeah, what's cool about these um, is the fact that they've lived a life. Obviously not a really good life, maybe, for either of them. Sure. One got painted over and the other one had a broken neck. But they continue to make music, and they really inspire me to play in a certain way. I could see how that would be, yeah. So, th let, so let me ask you that. Yeah. You do feel like a different vibe when you play each one. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I want to play different stuff on each guitar. Every yeah. single one of these, regardless of um, year or if it's an ep Epiphone or yeah. Gibson, every single one makes me wanna, um, I'll pick it up and I'll hit something, like a, I'll hit a note, yeah. and it's almost like a domino effect. It's like whatever that note gives me, I play off of that. Yeah. And especially in a live scenario with a band, it's so important because I think that, especially in like an improv level, it's like if I grab certain guitars, certain nights, it's just like, I'm, I'm able to like speak through them, yeah. you know, and I'm, I really can get out what I want to say. No, that makes total sense. And you're mm -hmm. right. It's like each guitar has its own thing that, that makes you pull certain things out of it, uh, totally. which is a, a great reason to have multiple guitars. <laughs> and, and I'm not, for, for the record, I am definitely not a collector on any level. And, right. and I, don't, uh, I don't pretend to be like a, a, 
uh, know everything about Les Pauls. Well, these have crossed your, you've crossed paths with them. It's yeah, been a natural, I I organic. Go, yeah. yeah, I didn't go s search them out or go online to buy them or anything. It's like everything now that, that I do and that I play, I want it to, um, to have a purpose and a reason. Yes. I just don't want to have gear because someone told me to have gear. Yeah. And not to say that because I have these, but it just feels more real that way. No, I understand. Just like, and you know what? Real player, real, real, um, you know, uh, approach to stuff. And, and I totally dig that. Man, you know, thank you for so, just thank you for sharing all this with us. Yeah, man. I, you know, I think you're one of the first people on one of these interviews that have like brought all their stuff with them. And it's like so awesome to see that. Real quick, I mm -hmm. want to touch base on what's currently happening with you like oh, you've, you've been busy yeah because i know busy. i barely have you here today yeah, yeah. And we might shoot something at the end of september or something mm -hmm. but man tell tell everyone what's going on right so now so i released a self-titled record in january and i've been touring supporting that like a madman and yeah. it feels today's the first of august when we're filming this yeah but the reality is it feels like i've been like on the road for like a year supporting yeah. it it's only been like six a little over six months okay so what's coming up with me is Man, I'm doing, um, finishing up this summer, we have some festivals here in August. I have to fly out and do some stuff on the um, on the West Coast and then an East Coast tour. And then basically from September 10th until December 14th, I will be out on the road. Wow. Yeah, like, not just like a little bit, straight. Wow. We're gonna go to Europe. I'm doing a, um, my first real headlining run across Europe. It's nine weeks. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's gonna be crazy. Wow. And I'll, I'll have all this gear with me. Yes. I'll bring these old guitars and the new ones. Yeah. And um, then after that, I, I wrap it up and we do, we come home um, the day after Halloween, so November 1st. Okay. And then I'm on the road in the States from November 1st to December 14th. So the you're whole year. Man. You're and, touring. Yeah, and I'll you're, say you're this, playing. For anyone that really um, is trying to figure out how to get out there and how to do their thing. Yes. Stick to what you do and what you love because when you're out there, you'd rather be doing something you love than playing some music where you're like, oh no, like I gotta, this is what I'm, it's like, you know that old quote, be careful what you wish for? Yes. All of a sudden it's like, wait, I gotta go on tour and I'm gonna be out until like Christmas. And I feel so lucky and so grateful to do what I wanna do and yeah. play, the, play the way I wanna play. So um, yeah, man, busy. Already got another record in the can ready to rock. So Busy man. Yeah. And you know what? Good message there. I was going to ask something inspirational from you, and I think you just nailed it. I think nowadays we're always, especially with like the gear approach, you know, you buy what works for you. You come across stuff. I know sometimes we get caught in the like, well, I should have a little bit of everything in case something comes up. I mean, you know, if you're more of a studio player or like mm -hmm. more of a session player, I, I could see that being a thing. But, you know, for all of us out there, too, that are just watching and trying to build our rigs and trying to get our tones and all that. I think, you know, the message that I got from you today was like, you got to try it. You got to be, you know, be true to yourself. Yeah. And, you know, there's experimentation, but at the same time, like you'll know something that works when it's like in your hands and it all just kind of connects and all the stars align kind of Absolutely. Thing. And, and the last thing I could even say about any of that is, you know, what guitar, music, all this stuff, it's not, it's not a competition. Yeah. And I think that's a, a really um, important thing to remember every day every time you pick up the guitar is it's a tool of expression for me it's therapy it's for most of us the reality is it's like whatever works for one person might not work for you and there is no such thing as oh i i truly believe sure someone could be better than you uh because they could play maybe different chords or play a little extra but we're all on the same road yeah it's just where we're at yeah on the road and life's a lot more fun when Guitar is the most, you know, it's like, this is what I wait for every day to play guitar. Yeah. This is the, the, the fun. So once it starts becoming like, oh man, I gotta go play guitar or you get anxiety about it. It's like, take a break. Yeah. Just, you know, it's, uh, this is, this is supposed to be a, just fun, not competitive. And really I've made some of my best friends with this in my hands. I've been able to see the world with it. And it's all just been, cause I love it and it's yeah. fun. Man, that's awesome. Well said, my friend. Well said. On, uh, I, I mean, uh, that was just the way to hear it. And uh, I, I agree with you. I think it's a journey. I think it's something you got to do because you love it. And, and I, I mean, all the classic stories is about like 
you know, we just did it because we wanted to do it and it ended up being something big. We didn't think about being famous off the bat. We didn't think about having to be the best guitar player there was. Just this is what we did. Yep. Like you said, 12 hours a day flew by because that's what you were into. Yeah, you know? man. And I thank my lucky stars every day that I still get to play the guitar. And there's some people that want to hear me play the guitar. And yeah. Like, there's a few people. Yeah. You know. And it's cool because I sometimes I laugh and I sit there like everybody probably watching this and you're like, I just love to play guitar and play music. It's like yeah. you never, never had that notion of uh, anything more than that. Right, it's right. Just, just for the love of it. Well, and you, you talking to me right now, you know, for you're the same person before the interview and after the interview, and and I, I've noticed the consistency. So it's like it's the real deal, and uh, I appreciate that. Everyone course, appreciate man. that. I, it comes across in your music and your playing, man. So, uh, uh, you know, thank you again for taking the time to be here. Thanks, I am dude. so stoked to to have this moment with you and, and to be jamming with you. Yeah, and, man. Uh, learning and and, and exploring. Uh, on that note, why don't we do a little jam and, and uh, I'll take us home, man. I'll, Should I'll we do, do a little that, something that little in, uh, thing in A that we yeah, were doing before? Was, you read my mind. There on, we, we go. It. There we go. Let's, let's go, do baby. It. Okay, let's do it. I'll start us off here.